Welcome to the Stack and Bales podcast, empowering farmer, trucking entrepreneurs, and small business owners with your host, Jesse Bounds, an authority on the open road of business and founder of 104 Coaching. Well, I got my guest, Jason Sun. Is that how I pronounce it? Yes, right? yes. S-O-N. Yes. Um, so Jason's a customer of mine. He lives in uh, officially Canada, right? Or yeah. Or half of Korea and? Yeah, I travel between uh, Canada, U.S., and uh, Korea. South Korea, by the way, South Korea. Yep. Yeah. Um, and when you tell people that you export to Korea, mm. then a lot of times they ask, is it North Korea or South Korea? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not uncommon, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I get asked that question. Um, you know, what's crazy is when I went there the last time that we, I don't know where we were at, but we were like by the fence. Mm-hmm. Like, but they said it was the DMZ. I guess. Yeah. Um, or or you could see they were like over that way is where they're at. Yeah, yeah. The uh the DMZ uh I don't know what the park is called, but yeah, you go to Korea and that's one of the stops that you uh it's a must stop. It's a must stop. Must so stop. you so just for everyone that's gonna watch this, so you um are in the hay export business. Yes. You are a buyer seller. Yes. You have a we'll talk about how it works. The you have a company based in Canada, and you have an importing company in Korea, right? Right. And your family, your father, was in the business. Yes, right? my father uh, started um, an importing company in Korea. Yes. And how long did he import hay for? Like, when did this whole industry start? Do you think? Um, like early, 80s? Uh, like late 80s? Early, yeah, late 80s. Um, early 90s? 90s. Yeah. My father started back in 2000. Two, three, okay. Like so he did that. That was his career, basically. I mean, more mm-hmm. towards the end of it. I mean, he did that. He traded hay or imported hay until he retired. So he uh, started out his career in the uh, the NH group. Um, and just to clarify, like, so no one would know what that is, but right. But NH is a large, like a co-op. like a yeah yeah large um, co-op in Korea. Um, so he started. Uh, his career working for the the NH group, the co-op of the Korean co-op. Um, he uh, he ended his career um, in like a uh, like a TMR. Okay. Um, and a TMR guys is like a, a facility that people they blend the feed in. So like right. in the states, we blend feed at the dairy. Right? Mm-hmm. We import that feed and mm-hmm. we mix it in the mixer truck. But at these right. farms in, in Asia, they don't have the capacity a lot of them to mix like the, that. the bigger farms mix it but a lot of the smaller farms yeah the smaller farms buy the finished product right so there's these yeah. facilities basically right. where they will you know bring different containers and they'll unload that product and then they're going to mix it and then they deliver it to the dairies right and the, beef the dairies or the beef cows, beef cows right. whoever needs it yep. yeah yeah so he worked for nh then he worked for tmr well, he worked for or the TMR that was the NHTMR. The NHTMR, right? Yeah, and then um, the um, so NH has a has a has a banking side. Uh, so he worked at the bank. Um, I don't know his career, right? Like inside no, out. but like yeah. you, you're the only person that I've ever met that there that it's a second generation brokerage business. Mm. That most okay. of the brokers or the traders there's a few of Yeah, there's a few of us. Um, so, no, there's, yeah. I mean, I think we're just entering either second or you know third generation. Right. Yeah. So no, there's there's a couple of us who's who's um, who's just continuing their their family. So like a tell us what vehicle. what a broker or importer in the hay business does. Like most people, we're doing, you know, people don't understand this type of business. Sure. Um, so uh, so we 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 you know we. Some you know, depending on what kind of broker you are, um, you know. For example, when you first enter, uh, most likely you're just a broker that facilitates uh, a sale between a supplier and an importer. So, what that means is, you know, a, a supplier will uh, give you a, a product at a certain price, and you are either working with a set margin or you set your margin yourself and you are, um, you know, given that product to, not necessarily, you're not the one giving it, but you're selling it on behalf of your supplier. And you guys always make a lot of money, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Especially in the hay business. <laughs> yeah, in the hay business. No, we work with, 
you know, I mean, as a broker, you don't, you don't, you're not working it's with not much margin. No. Yeah, you a lot are, of times you feel like you're losing money. Sure, sure, but but our overhead cost is not high either. So we yeah, don't, you've got admin help, and but, but you're mm-hmm. not, you know, for you, you go out and buy and sell. And yeah, we don't have a lot of investments. All 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 that we need is just a computer and a, and a truck, and um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, our, our margins are thinner because of you know lack of investments that we are required to make right. in order to enter the space. Yeah. So. so uh, Today, mm-hmm. the market's been a little challenging. You just came from looking at some hay up north. Sure. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, in the hay business, want to know what's going on. They don't understand. I get the question all the time. Why is it so bad? Mm-hmm. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. Um, like when did this? I tell them this was started. I feel like it started well before COVID. You know, I can remember in. Uh, back when the shipping. I mean, the market wasn't great. Really, back when the port did their strike, like in mm-hmm. sixteen, I think it was, or seventeen, or eighteen, or you know, but I, I can't remember what year. But before COVID, I remember Timothy Hay being on consignment, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. then, and then the, the the port slowed down, so lack of supply, mm-hmm. right? Kind of created this false. I felt like a false sense of a market. Okay, and yeah. then it was like, and then it was like. Then it kind of rebounded, did okay, and then I feel like it was it was we, where we're at today would have would have we've already we would have already been there if it wouldn't have been for COVID, mm-hmm. and then I think then COVID came, and so it kind of pushed that crash that was going to come out farther, and then now we're living it, you know, again. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think the the whole COVID um, it just wasn't applied to our industry, but it was applied to every single industry. You know, things got inflated, just like you know they did. And um, it got inflated too much, and it, it crashed, and uh, we're just kind of at a recovering stage now. Yeah. Um, so, how is the exchange rate? Is that I mean, is that causing some issues? Do you feel like for the for the U.S. farmers or not too much? I mean, exchange rate is something that we don't we don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to, yeah. but it is it is something that we absolutely need right. to pay attention. And it's more or less uh, that's affecting. Our compet- us competing with a, com- like a different country, or a different country, right? Sure, sure. But it's not directly the reason why, I say, alfalfa hay is the price of this. It's not. That's not driven. It's exchange rate. That's more of a, a supply issue, right? There's mm-hmm. oversupply, lack of demand. Correct. I, I don't think an exchange rate really has is the is the trigger behind demand. Or, I mean, it, it facilitates. It, it adds on to the demand, or it, it, it adds to the lack of demand. But I don't think that's the sole reason. Um, and there's a lot of people that are waiting on our presidency in the U.S. to change. And I think that's going to fix the hay business or a business. And I don't. Okay. I, I, I don't. I tell them, well, as much as we would love that to happen, um, the hay export business, or even we'll just talk about no, hay export. The the hay export business is not going to change overnight if we have a different president. It's 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 a commodity. There's really no trade issues with Korea and Japan. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just a lack of, it's just a supply and demand issue. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, this is just me personally talking. I don't think any president in any history has power, and, and sure, to a certain extent, but no, we got to figure this out on our own. Right, right. right? Yes, yes, yes. No president's going to do it for us. No, no. And that's, that's one thing that I think a lot of people are like, oh, no, I'm just, they're like waiting for the presidency to change. And then they think, oh, all our problems are going to go away. And I'm like, guys, you, this, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Your problems are just going to be wiped away. You need yeah. a fresh, fresh slate to start on. Right. Uh, so what product is the most important in the creative? Tall fescue. Tall fescue. How, many, how many tons total? Oh, shoot. I don't know. Well, how many, was, was there 1.2 to 1.4 million metric tons coming to Korea, probably, right? Not total. quite there, 1.4, but I think we're, we're in that 1.2 range. Right? So about 1.2, right? A mm-hmm. big year is like 1.4, I think. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the majority of, or the, no, not the majority, but the largest amount of that is tall fescue, right? Correct. Yes. And most of it's going where? To, to the beef market, to the dairy market. Yeah. And people always ask me, why? Why are they importing all this product? Because cows gonna eat. But they don't have enough there, right? Right. Not not uh, uh, not a hundred percent of 
what they eat. Yeah. Do so you know how many, have, you know, how many tons, do you know how many, how many tons of like rice or their, their own domestic they use? So as far as tons go, I don't know, but Korea is able to fulfill what they need. Um, their, their domestic production uh, can fulfill about 80% of their total forces. Wow. So if we're importing 1.4, Mm -hmm. They're consuming a lot, yeah, like eight million, sure. or more. Than, you know, wow. Or, um, so let's that. say that. So let's say they're feeding ten million tons of product of mm -hmm. forage, right? Mm -hmm. And they're importing twenty percent. Sure. Yeah. And, and it started with the dairy industry first, right? I mean, the beef industry. Um, you know, it started a lot later, um, but because you know we're able to produce uh, highly nutritious hay. Which the which Korea can't, and, and you know the dairy cows need the nutritious hay more than the beef cows do. And why can't they? Uh, just precipitation. So um, it's the climate, right? Uh, correct. Uh, the, I mean, and, and just a bunch of things. Um, you know, the price of land doesn't justify growing hay. Is uh, it hard to buy land there? Is it hard to buy? Yeah, land? if I want to go buy a farm. I was like, hey, Jason. Depending on how much money you have, I guess. But you can not buy it. Sure. I, mean, I just heard like some countries, like it's like in England or somewhere, it's like almost impossible to buy land. Mm -hmm. But not in Korea. No, Korea. I mean, it's a very small country, right? Right. Um, and it's it's got lots of mountains, and it doesn't have a lot of land. That's what people don't realize. Like when you go there, you um, you drive around and you... you you're surrounded by mountains. You're, yeah, you, you, feel, mm -hmm. you feel like you're in the country. And you're like, oh, well, why couldn't they grow stuff? And then you look at the terrain, and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's all green. And then mm -hmm. it's like this. It's like this. Yeah. Now, now, you had the opportunity to go to the countryside, so you're able to see, see those mountains. But, but, you know, I mean, most people that come to Korea, they're, they're staying in Seoul, and they don't see mountains. Yeah. But, yeah, mm -hmm. big city. Yeah. yeah. But, but it, it's got lots of mountains. You know one thing that I didn't realize, and I don't understand what the hell our problem in here is? How do you guys have cell phone service everywhere? You guys, you could be driving all the way to the countryside through any tunnel, and you guys never lose service. Yeah. Shit, I can't even get service in this thing. But, I mean, you have, I mean, it go, comes back, it's all pros and cons with uh, having a smaller country. You know, but, they, I mean, in the middle of a fucking tunnel, it's like, in the mountain, you guys have service. Yeah, but, I mean, it's just, they have a lot less land to cover. Whereas you guys have good technology there. Well, no, I think it's just a pure thing of um, just you know how big the U.S. is versus how small Korea is. You know, um, the power. They just, they they just right they're, they're able to cover you know most of the uh, yeah. the surface. It works. It was, yeah, we were just driving. You know, the, the lap, Michelle and I we were going last time we were there. We we're going to the countryside and we we're going through this tunnel. She's like, "Holy shit! I can't believe my phone has yeah, service in here." I, I I haven't. Yeah, I don't know if there's any. Places in Korea where you don't, don't get have service. I know it's weird. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there is, but yeah, no, you get service. I just thought you guys were better than us. You have way better technology. It's <laughs> <laughs> my best. Yeah. Um, no, it's, um, you know, when I, she was nervous about going the first, you know, when we met you. Okay. You know, she was like, oh, foreign country. She's kind of like, okay. I don't know about this. Hmm. And I was like, it's fine, it's fine, you know. And, so we went over there, was it like two years ago, right? We didn't go last oh, winter, it was the winter before. Was it like two Yeah, it was like two years ago when we went over there. And, oh. uh, you know, you told, you, 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 that little trick about not going to sleep. Yeah, the first day is very important. Right, the first day is very important. So yeah. Jason said, hey, whatever you do, try to stay up as late as you can. Mm -hmm. And it works. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that, it works for me, so I try to, whoever needs the advice, so I give them that advice, but I, I don't, I don't think it works on everyone because I've had some people just said, you know, you get you're so tired, and when you just don't sleep and go over that the, the tiredness, you can't sleep. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so the straw comes. So how it works is we so we bail haul, we press it. Mm -hmm. and I have some customers that I sell to direct. And then Jason, for example, has customers that he sells to. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we will sell it. Uh, I will either sell it to Jason. Deliver to, deliver a certain to a certain destination. So like sometimes I will give him a price delivered to the port. And then he will give us a booking, which is uh, basically space on a vessel for a ship. And then they will provide the booking. We will give him a price there with no freight. Mm -hmm. 
and then it's his responsibility. Yep. Uh, sometimes we will get we will price it to him because he has an importing company, similar to like my customers, we will price it to him with our booking delivered to delivered Korea. to Korea to mm-hmm. the port. Then at that point, it's your responsibility to take that part. You guys, the, the containers can only sit you know in the port for like what 10, 15 days, depending on the carrier that you guys right. have the contract. But on average, with. like say fifteen, ten to fifteen, right? Yeah, demerge days. We were, I mean, that that's our job is to try to get the maximum demerge and detention days, right? right. So the number of days. Yeah, and so the demerge is inside the port, inside gates, the port. right? Like mm-hmm. inside, so inside the CY container. And then when the, once it sits there, how much is it typically a day? I mean, it depends on the carrier, but hundreds of dollars a day, right? Oh, per container, per container. anywhere from uh, anywhere from ten dollars to like forty dollars per per, 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 day, per day per day. And then when it's and then you also when the container leaves the port, the it goes line. it goes to detention, right? Yes. And at that point, is that typically when you're taking it off site and you're taking it to the warehouse to unload it? Is that what that means? Mm, no. So, um, well, sure. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean. Um, yeah, once it's outside the container yard, mm-hmm. you're you're starting to use your detention days. So, um, what's standard? You play? Fourteen days. Fourteen days. Yeah, and then so you got fourteen days to return the container. Yeah, so you usually need to take it, you unload it, either take it to a farm or to another warehouse. Which right? usually only takes about a day or two, okay. right? But we're trying to use the additional. Time. What's cha- as being an importer? Like, what's probably the most challenging part for you guys? Oh my. That's not, that's not. Like managing that? Is that an issue? Um, like like shipments, a, uh, getting too much product. Like like we were just talking about, we had to delay some orders for you because we had trucking issues. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden you might have like maybe more product coming at once than you sure. originally anticipated. Yeah, that's or, a big challenge. That's right? a big challenge. Um, so I would think managing that would be... Yeah, that, that's a big I mean, that's, that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we have is... Um, you know, when we get so-called ETAs, they're just estimated. And that's estimated right? time of arrivals um, for the containers to land in the Asia. Right. right. Or any destination. Right. Um, so we are basing our sales, um, you know, on that day, you know, assuming that it will arrive, you know, on that day. But, it, you know, not, I don't, I don't want to say never, but in, it usually never arrives on that day right. and uh you know if it is uh, stopping by china for example um, the eta can vary anywhere from 10 to 30 you know i've had you know shipments that arrived 40 50 days later than it was supposed to and so what do you i mean that's that's a big big challenge right um you know this this cargo that we were supposed to have you know 40 days ago arrives 40 days later the person that we were supposed to sell to is you know can't wait 40 days so you know uh, but yeah i mean adjusting the schedule um that's a that's a big challenge but yeah. just like you guys have challenges here yeah like no exactly but i just want to know from your eyes this aspect of like, importing mm-hmm. um and then what happens uh shipbacks okay so the containers get inspected, right? Right. And what can they be shipped back for? Uh, uh, prohibited plants, right? So, um, for example, Korea uh, prohibits uh, wheat, barley, tricale. And why do they? I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just always been that way for me. But so they have their reasons, but you know, um, it could be political. Most of it is political. Okay. Um, most of it just, you know, it's just not, not having it's, yeah, it's not allowed. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So triticale, wheat, and then like uh, oh, a bunch of other things. There's a bunch sure. of them. Yeah, and then there's and then dirt, right? Contamination. Yeah, if you have a lot of dirt in it, um, then it's a reason for a ship back. And they also test for various um, pesticides, chemicals. I don't have the names of all the metals. Yeah, I mean, so um, yeah, they test for a bunch of stuff. And you're right, uh, right? And yet, yeah, so what happens is an order. Typically, it orders five containers, and if there's a ship back, all five are coming back. So if they mm-hmm. test one container, mm-hmm. then all five are being returned. Yeah. And like right now, the ocean freight's five to six thousand per container coming back. Mm-hmm. And so you, so for someone like myself, I had to pay the freight over, mm-hmm. and I and I have my trucking yeah. and my freight going up. 
and then I've got my truck and my freight coming back, mm -hmm. so it could cost fifty thousand dollars. Oh, easily, I mean, easily for a ship back. Yeah, depending on, I mean, and you didn't sell the product. Yeah, so well, so you got to so bring it back to your so facility, almost, or yeah, so it's almost a hundred thousand dollar problem. Sure, I mean it's not cheap. No, that's right. depending on where it went to, where you want to bring it back to, and where you want to take it back. But yeah, it, 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 it varies. Right, it's costly. So. Um, that's a risk of exporting. That's a risk of, no, a risk risk of risk importing, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if Jason would have bought, buys part from someone and the, and the yes. contract is in your name mm -hmm. and the, the shipper like myself kind of walks away or the exporter and says, hey, uh, that's your problem. You have to deal with it because the, 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 the contract with the shipping line is in your name. That's right. So there's a lot of risk in your position. Ship back, yeah. For example, right. I mean, me uh, as, a, as a CY um, shipper, like not just a broker, but... I'm the one that's paying the carriers to have the product shipped over to Korea. Um, I'm responsible for uh, the ship back. Yeah. What uh, when the when our containers arrive over there, and then the hay is, you know, reboot taken out. What what primarily is exported back to the U.S.? Sorry, say that. Like what's so, exported primarily from Korea? Yeah. Oh, um, semiconductors. Um, the, the Samsung, part, like a lot of that. Yeah, electronics, TVs, electronics. Um, oh shoot, I mean, just tons of stuff. Right? Yeah, the cars and the steels. I'm sure those go on a bulk vessel or the, the car vessels. I don't right. know what they're called. Um, oh shoot, I don't know. Uh, cell phones. Um, I would think, unless they have their factories here. Yeah, what's interesting is people always ask me how much is the freight. Well, the freight, let's say right right now, contain inbound ocean freight's like five to six thousand. And it's you know hundreds of dollars to ship it over there. So mm -hmm. people just are always blown away. Like, how can you ship hay all the way from you know the U.S. over to Asia and make it work? And it's well, that whole business was built on a backhaul. I mean, mm -hmm. Built on typically containers come in loaded and mm -hmm. they go back empty. And so we're just kind of like catching a ride. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I mean, we we say it in like a joking way. It would cost you more than it would cost. Like it would cost you. What from here to just to go to your house, which is a couple of kilometers yeah. away, it would cost you more than 150 bucks, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But um, it costs from LA to go to Asia, it costs less than 200 dollars for a 40 foot container. Yeah. Um, so no, yeah, it's really reasonable. So out of all products, we were talking about this uh, before the we we, were, we shot this, but. We feel like Oregon is, we're still in the best position uh, out of all states, right? Um, there still seems to be demand for our product. Mm -hmm. Washington's really challenging for alfalfa and Timothy, right? Mm -hmm. it, how's Timothy compared to alfalfa? Uh, do you feel like there's more demand for Timothy versus alfalfa or oh, are kind of similar? Or, that, uh, like, where's the Timothy market at today? I think that, I mean, that's a two different animal. I mean, Timothy markets. Uh, it's okay. You have to understand, like, Timothy production is nothing compared to alfalfa. Right. Timothy's... But if you're a Timothy grower, mm -hmm. well, um, what would you, what's your opinion for them? I think Timothy growers are, are, are fine. Okay. I mean, I mean, I don't... They might not... Have, no, but they might not feel fine, like but you feel... most. So most growers don't get any feedback about the market. Okay. Right? It's either we're buying or we're not buying. Okay. Right. So I just from you being you're you 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 talk to the customers every day. You're heavily into this business. Mm -hmm. You don't own a hay press. So you're not just as a outside perspective. Like okay. for so for Timothy, if, you're, if I was a Timothy grower, mm -hmm. and I'm like Jason, should I look for a new job or should I? It's challenging now, but but um, no, I I think Timothy there will always be. A place for it. Yeah. 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 Knowing we all know it's challenging now, but mm -hmm. overall, and when alfalfa is, is a little, I feel like a little different story because of China. China's demand has fallen off so heavily. Right. 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 That alfalfa is going to be the demand for alfalfa is much bigger than Timothy. It's just that we have much bigger production. Right. Back to the supply and demand because they're growing yeah. alfalfa all over the United States. States right. Yeah. Um, and then what about the PSW products like Klein? Uh, what else do you guys? So from PNW, it's alfalfa, it's it's uh, Timothy, Timothy, grass straws, also grass Oregon. Straw. What about the PSW? Uh, so the PSW, PSW guys, uh, like Bermuda Central, Hay, Raleigh, Arizona. 
Right, El Centro, yeah. Uh, Pine Grass, uh, Bermuda Hay, Bermuda Straw. Uh, Korea doesn't, but Japan does a lot of Sudan. Right. Um, what am I forgetting? Yeah. Straw. Yeah. How's the, how is the, how is that going? How's it's, it's okay. Look, I mean, in my opinion, everything's going okay other than off offer. Yeah. Um, everything's not, and you know, it's not, it's not great, but it's not terrible. Right. Um, where do you, uh, where do you see it? Do you feel like we're kind of, I feel like we're kind of in the, not that things are going to go up, but I feel like we've kind of seen some settling, a little bit of stability, at least in it. I feel like it's a little bit, like there was a lot of Hopefully. dumping, a lot of price mm-hmm. dumping, right? I mean, every time we would say, okay, if this is the bottom, this is the bottom, right? For alpha, alpha, For alpha, alpha right? Um, I think a lot of people just don't understand how weather dependent mm-hmm. these markets are, like especially other countries, like for grass straw, you know, our biggest competition is rice straw and Australia product. The domestic, yes. Right, the domestic product. Right. So I think Australia's product doesn't start coming into Korea really. In, I mean, have their new crop starts coming in in like what, November? Uh, yeah, November, December. November, December. Yeah, so, yeah. And then the like, Korea rice straw gets harvested in October. And yeah. we are hoping always for typhoons. <laughs> the customers, no comment on that. No, <laughs> yeah, yes. no but. but um, uh, if the rice straw gets rained on mm-hmm. and they can't get out of the fields, mm-hmm. then there creates typically more demand for sure. imported straw. Yeah. yeah, less supply, so more demand for us. Yeah. Yeah. If they have a bumper crop, mm-hmm. they get a good harvest, they have lots of straw and non rain gone, mm-hmm. um, then it's just, then we're going to lack of the pork. Then our market is just, we're not, they're not going to need to import as much from, from, at least from the U.S. Yeah, I mean, as an importing country, they're always, it is, their job to, you know, have alternatives, right? right? And during COVID, when our prices shot up, um, my customers went to other countries, um, you know, countries like, I mean, Australia was a big supplier, but, you know, Spain had huge growth. Um, We had countries that have never exported to Korea start exporting um, uh, replacements. Yeah, because we couldn't supply them enough, right? So we they- couldn't supply them enough because of the logistics issue and also our prices skyrocketed. I think a lot of people, a lot of farmers especially don't understand that when they're marketing products, that yes, we want to, obviously as a business people, we want to try to get as much as we can for our product, sure. but there's a cap, right? And when you when you hit that cap, your customer starts looking for products in other places, right? We, we are, as an exporting country, we are competing on an international level, right? Um, and we have, on an international level, we have to consider who we're competing against or what we're competing against. Other countries. Against. Sure. And it doesn't matter if it's hazelnuts, like here we have all these okay. hazelnuts, right? They're, they're competing with not themselves as much as you know other countries, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, I think there's just a huge disconnect uh, between a lot of people and like, I need this. Well, yes, we. I agree. We need that to operate. But are you going to get that? And you're not always going to get in a commodity market. You're not always going to get what you want. That's that's you know that's the world, right? You don't always get what you want. But but you know you get more than what you want sometimes. Right. Yeah, it goes both ways. And then you're supposed to save that that amount for when you don't get as much as you want. What you do with them? You know, not go buy new tractors. Well, you know, yeah. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, with every, yeah, sometimes you have a good year, sometimes yeah. you don't, right? So that's that seems it. to be the hay business. That seems to be every business, no? Yes. Yeah. No, I think um, growers are really, they're, they just are really just waiting and wondering and asking a lot of questions. And yeah, we're going through some tough times. We're going through some tough times. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, the market is unfortunately the market, and it's, we always say that, it's going to kind of dictate where it goes. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot of weather events that um, are going to, you know, weather, I, I just keep going back to weather because I feel like every time there's a, uh, the market takes a, a big change, it, it seems to always be driven. That's what's driving it. The weather. Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, like for here, if we're, I mean, just for example, like a couple of years ago, we didn't have very much fescue straw, right? Because mm -hmm. we didn't get much rain. All of a sudden, we got you know, way short on straw, mm -hmm. and that changed the market, right? Mm -hmm. And then also, we had a bunch of straw, mm -hmm. we had a bunch of rain, we had a bumper crop, and then next you know, six or eight months mm -hmm. down the road, we have too much product, mm -hmm. and then we're dumping, we're, all of us exporters are cutting each other's throats, dumping price, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to offload all this product. When the market's like, hey, it's not like really that bad, but now we're competing with ourselves. Mm -hmm. But it comes back, right? I mean, look, we we know that it just it does a full circle. You just got a cash flow through it, right, Jason? It just yeah, it does a full circle with every market. It does a full circle. So, um, so if overall for growers, they need to just hang in there. Don't buy a bunch of shit. I, I'm not a grower, so I'm not giving any advices, but... Alfalfa's going to be tough. I think alfalfa's got a little ways to go. Now, mm -hmm. the, okay, and this is what I wish I had um, yeah. old John Paul on here from Hay King, so he's the, he's the, he's got all the, he's the numbers guy. So okay. it comes to, you know, acres of what's being produced, and, and, and they're, what we really need, what the growers really need, um, is the uh, export market isn't going to save them? They need domestic demand here. Yeah, the dairies need to be get back. The dairies need to be back buying off alpha. Milk price is going up here, so um, hopefully guys will start buying hay again. There has been no domestic demand. Well, I mean, if you look at the numbers, I'm not exactly sure on the exact figure, but uh, the the amount of um, alfalfa that gets exported. Is less than ten percent oh, of it's, the entire production, right? It's a tiny market. Uh, I mean, fair amount. Yes. Of the West Coast, I think that number is a little higher. But if you look at the the U.S. overall, it's I know it's less than ten percent. Yeah, it's not. So and, and, it's and the domestic market. It is the domestic yeah, market. But it alpha. comes to alfalfa. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the domestic market, you know, just you know, like all that straw kickouts I was showing you that I have out here. It's like I was telling Jason, we just don't have, and we don't, you know, on the West Coast or in Oregon, we don't have any big feedlots. Uh, the dairies don't, you know, use grass straw because they grow their own silage and have, mm -hmm. you know, all their own feed. So that's why we're so heavily, you know, relying on export, mm -hmm. and, you know, and especially in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the growers that are uh, growers, yeah, you need to um, hope that uh, the dairies get back buying, and then you know, beef beef prices are so high that guys can't afford to buy cows to feed them. This, even though the hay is cheap, mm -hmm. they don't want to take the risk. They know the minute they go buy a cow mm -hmm. that's high priced, and they buy cheap hay, they got to feed it. Yeah. Typically, the, 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 the beef price is going to drop and they're going to get stuck. Right. I mean, that's... And so it's kind of like, there's cheap feed mm -hmm. for, a, a, you know, for a cattle farmer. They got cheap feed, but they're like, hey, I don't want to take the risk to go buy a cow. Mm -hmm. Knowing no, no. that every time I buy, typically... <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know these feed prices, we've learned that don't you know that they they, they uh, you know they go up and down. So it might be cheap today. But who knows where it'll be a, a year from now? Yeah. Well, there's only th one thing that's gonna tell us. It's gonna be time. Yeah. We'll yeah. see where the market's at. Yeah. So we just have to stay in it. So you, uh, where are you at after you? So you. You traveled over here, you went to Ellensburg, you checked out hay, there's mm -hmm. plenty of hay around. Mm -hmm. well, um, or, okay. yeah. or, or quality, is it is there quality hay? Or what do you feel like overall? Um, well, I mean, I don't deal with every single, you know, supplier out there, so I, you know, this is just based on, you know, the, the, the suppliers that I deal with. Um, you know, we've had very, very good Timothy, right? Um, and what, what do you mean by that? It's a very good harvest. The, the quality in general is right. Good. Okay, got it. Right. Um, uh, but for the export market, or for my market, for example, Korea, we're, we're not users of high, high grade Timothy. What do you guys like? What do they like? Like when they look at Timothy, what, they, what's, what is Korea like? Oh, we like green. So green. Mm -hmm. So no grass. What about the head size? Like what sure, the head size, um, you know, the bigger the better. Um, typically softer the better, but and is that not more palatable? Yes, sure. Yeah. And they feed a lot of Timothy when it's hot out. Is that, or they feed it the same amount year round? Or um, 
I was told they feed more in the summertime because it's more palatable and that's when it's hot and the cows don't digest as well. But I don't know if that was a little shit or... I think that there's true... Every to, time I've shipped him, I think it's only been in the summer. Really? Yeah, just when we go like spot by, you know, from um, you know, Uncle Tim or something. Okay. Or truck, right? Mm -hmm. They convinced me and you would need to buy some Timothy. <laughs> right, right. I want to ship it out of the gas. <laughs> I can't afford the market crashes. Right. I lose $100 a ton. Right, right. Um, he, Tim, you know, Tim, Timothy ships Tim, all Tim's all been all asking about you, by the way. Is that right? Yeah, where's that Jason at? we, we, we got to go visit him. We'll see Uncle Tim. Yeah. But, uh, so Timothy's being shipped all, uh, year round. Mm -hmm. um, so green color is most important, no brown leaf. But, I mean, that's never possible, right? That's what I'm right. saying is we would like no brown leaf, why but Korea typically nice, never buys. Well, Korea wants green everything, right? They want green fescue straw, they want green alfalfa. Yeah. Uh, green seems to be the most important first thing. Why is that? Just looks. But the cow doesn't know about it, does it? The cow is colorblind. Right. So but it's the buyer. It's, it's the buyer. The, yeah, it's yeah. the people that are paying for it. So, and whatever visually looks. Oh, I'm not complaining that they like green alfalfa. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not just Korea, too, though. I mean, here, I mean, yeah. anyone who who buys hay right. would prefer greener hay. No, you're right. Yeah. Um, and, and whether that's, you know, whether we get into the scientific things or not, you know, it's... Uh, People that are painful. Well, well, yesterday when Kelly was here and we were walking the press, I told them the cows were pretty smart, you know. Mm -hmm. they, well, they, they know the price of the hay, they eat them all, it's cheaper. <laughs> okay. Okay. That seems to be a deal, right? And they they eat more when it's cheaper. Well, or, you know, like let's say there's a problem with the hay, right? If the price right. is negotiated, all of a sudden they can eat it. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, any smart. animal, you starve it for a couple of days, they'll eat just like anything. Yeah. When, I was, when I was starting out, I was with one of my friends, we were loading out hay, like 50 pound bales mm -hmm. into, a, uh, into someone's pickup, this horse lady, and he was throwing some bales aside, yeah. and they were wagging on the bottom, okay. and she was like, what are you going to do with those? He goes, well, that's what I feed my horses. Mm -hmm. yeah. but it was really pack of mules, they were just, he'd let them dry out and, you know, pull it off, but you don't want to feed them. Well, it's actually, shit. business is not... Too different from selling your hay domestically. Yeah, there's differences, but the the, the core, the fundamentals are really not that no, they're not. The people don't want. It doesn't matter where you're at. They don't want dirt and rocks. And yeah, they're not paying for dirt. They're not paying for what, even though you know we tell them it's free. You know, they're not paying for it. I would say as an exporter, like for me, when I'm buying hay, there's one thing that, that let's go to alfalfa for example. One of the most important things is clean hay. When you're pressing and running hay and there's dirt and rocks in it, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Mm -hmm. If I had to say, you know, leaf retention or color or like, what is the most important to me, clean. Mm -hmm. That's number one. As, as someone that's buying and selling it, like running hay through a facility, right? Mm -hmm. I can have the cleanest or the brightest, green, nicest look of hay. Mm -hmm. But if it's full of dirt and rocks, well, that's going to cause you lots of major that. problems, sure. right? Yeah. It causes problems with the press, the customers. It can be the most beautiful hay, but they do not. They cannot get past rocks and dirt. No. Right? Mm -hmm. So I always say, number one, clean fields, right? Yes. So if I'm going to stay away from a grower, so any growers that listen to this, if your fields aren't clean, that's the number one thing you need to do is get your fields clean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just Because gonna... once you get a bad name as a grower for a contaminated hay, mm -hmm. pickups are just driving right by. Mm -hmm. No one's even going to stop. Yeah. Or or there's guys that are known for, you know, putting shit in the back of the barn and putting the good stuff in the front. And they think they're going to get away with it. Well, we're going to find it eventually, right? The sure. customer's going to find it. The, the guy running the hay in the plant's going to find it. Yeah. So, and so yeah, okay. as, a, as a grower, you know. Well, um, you want to be honest in every business yep. that you are in. I mean, you, you are, you know, your product is your, you know, um, have your integrity, right? So, what uh, when it comes to the uh, test of hay, this is one thing I want to touch on before we end up this field. It's like okay. Korea does. We look at tests. You look at tests, okay? But primarily, we clean green. Second is like. I would say what I've, what I've always told in Korea has always been that bigger stem, okay. clean green hay, mm -hmm. um, and people are just like, I don't understand why, you know, why why won't they take really fine third? Or, 
explain, is it, it's a yeah. palatability thing, is because they're mixing it, why is it that they, because in the States, we're local dairy, they're looking for fine, green, you know, just that, candy, and, and, and that, not that, not that Asia doesn't buy really nice hay, but they would rather like first cutting, they, they would prefer first or second over third, typically, unless third's a big step. Well, I, I don't know if they prefer a certain grade over others. Um, I think it's all just kind of how hay was marketed in Korea over the past 30, 40 years. Uh, you know, middlemen like, like us, you know, when we have second cutting or third cutting in inventory, we'll usually say why it's good to feed second cutting or third cutting, you know. Um, if we have a lot of first cutting in inventory, then we'll obviously try to market that. And that perception has grown, you know, over the years. And yeah, the challenging part with first has always been a pressing brown stem. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but I mean, but, but there, there are customers that, uh, because of that, like first cutting. And those are the dairy customers, right? Sure, I think so. Yeah, first cutting typically. Yeah. yeah. And then, like I said, the majority of the customers that we would sell to would take second. Oh, That's no. my customers, at least. Huh? I don't know. I would say second cutting. Like when I was, we'd show we ship second, clean. Yeah, green. second and third. Yeah, fourth second cutting. They, as, know, long as, as long thing. as third was big step. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, they liked it. You know what? They, yeah, you're right. They do like their second. I feel like they like second. Yeah, you know they don't like a super thin stem. No, no. And why is that? It's just because they're mixing most of it, right? Or do they think they pick through it? Or what do you think it is? Why? Like, why do you think? They like, um, <clears throat> I'm sure there's a reason behind it. Yeah. And I want to say, um, no, I mean stems got more. Fiber, I yeah, it seems to be a fiber issue. Um, but just generally, and, and I've been told this by the the generation uh, before me that just thin stem is not perceived very well. Okay, what's the average size of a dairy farm? It's average size of a dairy farm. Yeah. Oh shoot. Um, that's, um, how many cows? Couple hundred? Yeah, fifty to about a hundred. Fifty to a hundred cows. An average. An average. An average. What's a big dairy over there? Oh, thousand. Yeah, thousand. How many? How many dairies do you think there are? A thousand. A how thousand many dairies? dairies? No, how oh, many dairies? The there? number of dairies in Korea. Oh. Thousands. Oh yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Remote out in the countryside. Well, actually, a lot of the dairies are located in uh, what's called. Um, um, not even like the furthest from um, Seoul. Uh, the, the, the beef cows are scattered all over the country, but most of the dairy cows are actually uh, concentrated in, in an area called Kyunggi, relatively closer to Seoul. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that because, is it the climate that's there or the transportation from the milk to Seoul? Because that's the main population is, or like, why do you think that? That, that could be it. Why? Um, could be, yeah. The most consumption you, probably takes place in Seoul, so it would make yeah. sense economically to be close to Seoul. Yes. Yeah. And then is the and then why? Um, so there's two ports that the containers come into, right? As far there's there's a couple ports in, in Korea. There's Incheon, there's Pongyang, there's Busan. There's I'm sure there's more ports, but uh, hay only gets shipped to two ports, Pongyang and Busan. I've seen some hay enter through Incheon, but you know it's very very small. And one, the Pongyang is up at the top. I I call it the top, but it's no Pongyang and Busan. They're both at the very bottom of South Korea. Just ones at the uh, the east, yeah. ones at okay. the, the, the west. I got my bearings on. Yeah, Incheon's Incheon's the one that's uh, a little uh, up north, but. Yeah, like I said, Incheon does not get uh, a lot of shipments uh, of hay. So everybody's going to hang in there, we're all going to make it. I hope so. hope so, yeah. Demand, you just, so when were you in Korea last? Oh, I was there, what, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago. 
yeah, do warehouse yeah. supplies just kind of okay and it's not overfilling or way under or what's your take there because that's always what you know the, generally the warehouse is the judge on yes you know, inventory volumes and sure. things um when I was there there was a lot of off off um and there was quite a bit of uh, Australian no rain Australian no but you know again I'm not looking at every single warehouse right but the warehouses that I have been to at the port, um, yeah, those warehouses have mature, uh, yeah, uh, and, and uh, okay, mostly. Well, I guess we're gonna find out a couple months. Well, the market always, it's our busiest months are from now till January. Okay, yeah. And then in January, it either doesn't crash or it crashes. Let's, let's, let's not hope for that. I mean, well, I'm hoping it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, but, yeah, but that's always typically that's like the, the ultimate like time that we know. Mm -hmm. Seems like that's the the January the normal day. graph. That's the graph. If I was going to say yeah, when it when it does so this, and, yeah, yeah, the dips, mm -hmm. and that's that. To me, it's always that weather things happening right there. That but the other countries are you know, the other yeah. countries are entering the market. Sure. And you've got so you got Australia coming in. You got the rice straw deal, and then after that, it's like okay. Right. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people, I mean, just people just, they're always like, what's the market going to do? What's the market going to do? And I'm like, whatever we're kind of at now it seems yeah. to be what it is until we get to that point. And then that point, and then even, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then from January to new crop, so from January to July, then mm -hmm. it's kind of touch and go. Because mm -hmm. I've seen the market do okay in January, February, March, yes. crash in April. No, we've seen we've the market seen, do, uh, you know, I mean. It's the danger zone from January to July. Sure. That's always my sure. Yes, yeah, that's I think so because you know you know we we're never able to get a full grasp on our inventory, you know, until the year's over, and then we start realizing okay, we got six months to a new crop. Um, we're doing much, this. We're going. Yeah, we're going. How many how many more months do we have to get rid of all this stuff? Right, right, and then we start up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well. Thank you for. Hey, thank you. You haven't been here in a while. No, no, it's uh, you're the you're the, like I said. You said I'm all the way at the bottom. But we're we're peasants <laughs> down here. We're, we're not North Valley straw guys. We're down at the bottom of Oregon. So it's it's so far to come down here. It's like an extra thing. No, no, no. You're going to all my competitors. <laughs> Buy from all my competitors too. So it's um, just. No, so uh, no. Thank you. I, uh, I this was as he was starstruck. He didn't know if he was going to be able to handle the. No, the a little, uh, a little flatter. No. A little flatter. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I. Uh, hopefully, eventually, I, re I release all of these. Yeah, and uh, I'm famous. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time. Till next time. Thank you.